Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar on the topic of digital twins. So today we're going to explore the exciting world of digital twins. To break it down, a digital twin is a virtual model designed to accurately reflect an intended or actual real world physical product, environment or process. This virtual representation can span your assets life cycle, is updated from real time data, uses simulation, machine learning and reasoning to help with your decision making. Today we're going to explore how we can combine the use of GIS so that it provides a powerful combination of capabilities for modelling and simulating your real world environments, allowing you to better analyse and visualise your information in the spatial context that we're used to. Spatial referencing can significantly enhance the accuracy and functionality of your digital twins by providing critical geospatial data that can be incorporated into your digital twin models. Let me give you a simple example. You can integrate data from multiple sources, say satellite imagery, sensor data and location of your assets. This might be a mobile asset at a mine site, a whole road that's prone to flooding, a pipeline or let's just say an offshore rig. Combine that with real time weather information. This allows for quick decision making in response to changes in the environment, say in the case of a one in 100 year weather event. Without this spatial referencing, it can be really difficult to understand the relationships between the different data sources and what these assets or people, uh, sorry, assets or which people may be in the path or at risk. So combining digital twins with GIS, we can create a more comprehensive and accurate representation of our real, real world models. This allows you to visualize complex geospatial relationships and identify these patterns and gain insights that would be possible to achieve with traditional data asset methods. The application of digital twins are endless, from autonomous mining operations, predicting equipment failures in the oil and gas industry, or you can take it as far as the SpaceX autonomous drone ship program if you want to. With the help of advanced technologies such as AI, IoT, Digital twins can provide a comprehensive view of your real world and, and enabling you to improve efficiency, identify potential issues before they occur and achieve your operational excellence. I'm excited to introduce today's guest speaker, Seth Gorey. Seth, feel free to turn your camera um, on and give everyone a wave. Um, Seth is a principal solution engineer based out of our Sydney office. He's been with ESI Australia on and off for about seven years and specialises in, in our architecture, engineering and construction industries. Um, but he is definitely our go-to guy for all things digital twin. And there's a lot of similarities about asset management and you know, that kind of stuff that I think you'll get a lot of value out of today. But before we cross over to Seth, I do want to introduce you to our resources team. So on screen, this is uh, ESI Australia's resource specific delivery team. Uh, up the top is our um, advisory services team and then below that is our principal consultants and consultants that work with you delivering our projects. You may or may not be familiar with some of these people on the screen, but I think it's just great to put a face to the Esri name, people that you deal with. And then uh, this is our account and client success teams. So uh, anything from account management to yeah, client success and also some solution engineers there as well. Before we do move on to Seth, um, I, I always like to throw it to Trevor for your thoughts or anything you'd like to share, please. Thank you, Jason. Welcome everyone. It's been uh, quite some time since we had a, had a rug and I think uh, we had originally scheduled a digital twin session maybe well over 12 months ago, um, but it was interrupted with with COVID. So we're finally here. I'm looking forward to it. And we've got Seth presenting, which is great. Uh, as Jason mentioned, he, he is sort of our go to guy around some of the digital twin stuff. And we don't always have an opportunity to um, access Seth and our resources um, practice. So it's great to have him on board. I know he's been working with some of our team around some really interesting renewable projects, um, which I think will probably resonate with a few as well. So uh, I know we've got a bit to get through, so I'll throw it back to you, Jason. Um, 
thank you everyone for attending. Looks like we've got some really great numbers um, and hopefully uh, it won't be such a long break between our, our next uh, resources user group. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Trevor. I'm literally going to handball straight to Seth. So without further ado, everyone make Seth feel welcome. Thanks, Seth. Over to you, mate. Thanks, Jason. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, nice to meet everyone virtually and hopefully in person again soon. So today we're just going to look at some of the foundation of um, how GIS and more specifically ArcGIS complements um, digital twins in this whole discourse or discussion, no doubt you're faced with today. And we'll describe it as very complementary and inherently the use and reuse of some of this digital twin content you're starting to capture or receive uh, is inherently valuable and will demonstrate hopefully why a spatially enabled digital twin is a better outcome for yourselves as the owner operator or your projects um, more broadly. We'll then jump into some uh, examples, some national ones, some from our region and, and some global examples. Those are public facing links. We'll endeavor to get back to you after this um, resource user group uh, session uh, so you can borrow some ideas, uh, explore it yourselves in your own time. And then we'll open up for any questions. Uh, if you've got questions throughout, as um, Jason's mentioned, please feel free to use the chat. Thank you as well, Trip. So most importantly, we always start by defining um, what we mean by a digital twin. And as uh, Jason's rightly uh, placed, uh, digital twins we define as virtual representations of the real world and including the physical objects, processes, relationships and behaviours, i.e. everything that happens on the ca common canvas being geography. And that's an important kind of point of difference because we realise there's many other uh, vendors and um, solutions available uh, that market themselves as a digital twin, but arguably everything happens somewhere on Earth. So we feel that the common canvas of ge geography is a very important consideration as you embark on uh, digital twins in your own organizations, projects, or your portfolio more broadly. So GIS as a foundational role uh, enables us to create spatially enabled digital twins of both the natural and built environment. Uh, the latter could be in the form of plant, not just um, tunnels and other uh, renewable energy infrastructure, um, uh, rather than kind of reading it as an urban environment per se. And what this enables to do is integrate uh, the multitude of information model typologies, everything from uh, utility network information models to um, um, uh, to landscape information models and so forth. And so we kind of, if we roll back to basics and um, hopefully everything you're well familiar with from a, a GIS and, and foundational spatial perspective, GIS offers us this ability to look at that holistic view of all the things, whether they are assets, physical in the real world or invisible aspects, uh, such as demographic data that informs our areas or designs or boundaries. So this is well known to ourselves and um, enables us to have this kind of top down holistic view. When we kind of roll forward to look at how location also assists us in laying the foundations of spatially enabled digital twins, rest assured this is not a new or unique um, phenomena. In fact, um, bodies in the region such as Anslet have been offering some principles and thought leadership for, for many a year now, which align to some global standards. And I encourage you to kind of familiarize yourself with um, the, the principles of spatially enabled digital twin, albeit from 2019 vintage. It's really a useful kind of uh, white paper uh, that might assist you in your in endeavors and, and positioning digital twins either complementary or um, receiving or producing content for your GIS system and by all means reach out to our respective teams including our advisory team uh, who we actually do a lot of these assistant or advisory pieces for. So you can hopefully see here um, this foundational spatial data infrastructure is core to enable us to attend to all of the different um, information model types 
And then as we look at, you'll probably hear in the digital twin discourse, this notion of level of maturity and level of information. The latter level of information is really akin to kind of attributing model elements, something that we've been doing for decades, arguably in the GI sector. What is different is this level of um, maturity and sometimes you also hear this definition of level of detail. Uh, level of detail you can think of as a, a bit of a fivefold, at least um, uh, enhancement, starting at a minimum of extruded building footprints or what we call uh, LOD 100, and then all the way to LOD 500 where you can actually have a model that has elements representing switches and all of the connectivity, uh, the electrical infrastructure associated to that switch. So level of maturity is instead looking at what we can do with these spatially enabled digital twins. Can we speak to it? Can it actuate? Can it simulate uh, both uh, proactively uh, in business as usual blue sky scenarios? Or as uh, Trevor and, and Jason have rightly pointed out in recent memory, uh, we're starting to see the use case of spatially enabled digital twins for a sense of resilience for organization. So show me my things, my assets in close proximity to current or uh, forecast events, be it fire, flood, uh, to the common ones in Australia. So as I mentioned, there's a whole multitude of um, information models, um, including you know landscape information models, um, building information models, uh, network information models, and arguably city, uh, city, city information models, but that could also be uh, your campus information models, uh, facility information models, um, any, anywhere where you've got kind of a concentration of your asset portfolio uh, is akin to a city information model in many respects. And foundational to all of these information models is, is geography, is that common canvas, but also uh, you're most probably already using your ArcGIS system uh, to attend to all these uh, myriad of information model types. So really GIS is that overarching framework which enables us to create and integrate um, information models uh, to spatially enable digital twins. <laughs> so here are just some examples of the spatial specificity. So by looking at sp spatially enabled digital twins, this enables us to uh, capture and integrate um, information, uh, including as simple as 2D floor plan plans and having a defect or condition assessments via ArcGIS field maps um, map back to the floor that those defects uh, or contaminants are detected on as you know a common use case but also the ability now to uh, integrate the types of data we're starting to receive and use this as the kind of launching pad or glue to other business systems uh, repositories for reports, as we can see on the bottom right there, from a model outbound to a traditional work order. Um, what's the value here? The value is really uh, expediting people, finding the right information in the system of record that is the master curator of such, such as work orders, um, and helping people get there faster, um, because as we can all appreciate, um, everyone is busy, but being able to wade through a document repository with no visual um, assistance is quite time consuming. So here we're pivoting to a 2D or 3D map as the visualization aid to launch in and link to those other repositories. Pretty innovative. Um, uh, in many regards. Another use case is being able to dynamically visualize um, all of the level of details you have for your assets. So sometimes in our kind of conversations with clients, they, they don't have um, you know a, a nice model like the one you see here on the right. Um, they don't have an architectural or BIM model. They might have LiDAR or at best 2D uh, floor plans. And the great thing about ArcGIS is it's flexible to attend to that level of detail you have available. And that might be as simple as this 2D interactive map uh, on the bottom right, or as you start to mature and receive, whether it's through a scan to BIM process or the procurement of <coughs> new in infrastructure like plant and receiving that from the architects, we can now actually use and reuse those architectural models 
and publish them and share them and integrate them in GIS, uh, um, uh, which is a really huge value proposition. Up the top in the middle there, we can start to see the integration of those uh, new 3D visualizations with other uh, attribution, be it coming from um, a finance or asset system like an SAP or a Maximo or some other repository. So here, this is where we start to see the adoption of 4D IE enabled with time to be able to roll back and forward and schedule to see how the contractor or yourselves internally are progressing against what was planned and, and approved. Uh, but also risk and other um, uh, dimensions can be added to really get us towards um, a, a 5D, 6D solution. So cost uh, as far as finance integration with your GIS visualization and risk are two of those and commonly referred to as 5D and 6D uh, capabilities. It also enables us to support patterns of collaboration and I'm sure internally um, you're well versed in the ability to uh, use that built in sharing model in ArcGIS, um, be it through ArcGIS Online or your enterprise, but also outbound to other agencies or organizations collaborating. And we see this most pertinent uh, where you engage contractors or subcontractors, say AEC firms, to assist on either the design or construction stage of uh, existing refurbishment or new asset. And rather than moving to a kind of um, a legacy pattern of emails and, and zip folders of um, data, we're starting to see organizations securely share content to provide a view ahead of time that would otherwise be dependent on a quarterly or monthly uh, transmittal from the said contractor or AEC firm as one use case. Now for those that have heard or are familiar with um, uh, ISO standard known as 19650, uh, this is around um, uh, uh, really BIM standards but there's inherent theme woven in there around the need to collaborate and seek feedback on uh, whether it's design or model reviews or the construction stage and phasing. Um, there's some really good examples from Europe where ArcGIS has been adopted as that kind of um, asset information model uh, to assist people in that collaboration sense. And beyond that, we can go to the next level where we start to get into the 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 most mature spatially enabled digital twins, where we can start to do simulations, start to do actuations, so integrations with SCADA and so forth. Um, be able to use sensing, be it through deep learning, machine learning. So one of the interesting use cases from the renewable sector is you might receive an as-built. Uh, BIM model, um, architectural model for a proposed solar farm. But obviously what's happening day to day, um, you want to track that against the schedule and progress. And there's actually a, a use case there of applying um, deep learning, machine learning and geo AI to um, detect uh, the installation progress of panels for a farm against uh, what a contract is um, agreed to as far as a program perspective. So quite unique and innovative ways that um, uh, spatially enabled digital twins can really start to attend to the, the highest level of um, maturity um, that I referred to earlier. So what's driving all of this um, kind of fusion of um, digital twins, uh, BIM and, and CAD and GIS? It's a lot of business drivers and they kind of summarize here uh, on half a dozen core ones, but there's many more. And I'm sure if we uh, opened up um, the lines, you'd, you'd be able to attest to uh, some that are front of mind um, uh, in recent weeks or months from your respective ends. First and foremost, it's to increase the efficiency. So a lot of this um, adoption of digital twins and say BIM standards and integration stem from the gains from manufacturing who have adopted modular patterns of designing and uh, implementing um, uh, for say fast moving consumer goods sector and so forth. Construction and um, uh, uh, 
uh, sector more broadly has has not really benefited from those gains. It's kind of been lacking behind. So still front of mind is this need to improve the efficiency between the four core stages of uh, project or asset life cycles being plan, design, build and operate, maintain, which um, uh, you're all well versed in. The other one is to be able to maximize your investment. So if you procure something, be it IoT or a model, uh, you want to be able to use it and reuse it. So uh, there's a really interesting case here from the Snowy Hydro where their models are relevant for the engineering and the O&M aspect in future um, for a facilities digital twin down the track. But right now, there's a reuse case for their communications and marketing team to share that um, internally or a redacted version in the public domain is one of the use cases. So yeah, really interesting kind of drivers that are focusing on why we need uh, spatially enabled digital twins. And some of the benefits of digital twins, um, there's a whole um, series of um, academic um, uh, benchmarking and case studies, um, but core highlighted here is to increase that uh, productivity. This stems from a um, uh, report and some research performed by Atkins, um, uh, who's a, a large consulting engineering firm. And you can see here some of those uh, centered around what was driving, uh, summarizes drivers on the previous slide. So de-risking projects, being able to uh, verify information and offer access, easy access to uh, any content that's available. Um, so really that's elevating that need for specialists driving desktop tools, be it CAD, BIM, or even you know GIS and, as part of the equation to instead be this pivot towards cloud or web-based experiences so that senior management project directors can jump in at any point in time and see their entire project or portfolio of assets and projects uh, as they so choose. So why is this important? Um, as I mentioned before from the manufacturing sector, the construction um, sector around digital twins has not really gained that benefit and it's a very lossy transaction. Um, so this is a more nuanced view of those four core pillars of uh, a project or asset life cycle. And it's kind of embarrassing at times where um, we still see a pattern of hard drives being kind of moved about between each of these stages and phases. And this kind of orange arrow or uh, series here is depicting that lossy nature of those handovers between different uh, entities, contractors and consultants that happen. So we feel that a spatially enabled digital twin uh, based on GIS and hopefully ArcGIS enables us to smooth out that lossy nature of the asset handover. And rather than waiting to um, the commissioning and operate maintain phase, Hopefully this will offer you a level of detail representation of what's available, no matter what stage or phase a project or asset is at. So we're seeing this uh, kind of round trip where in the collection phase, um, you know, a snapshot of that conceptual model is now ingested into um, uh, ArcGIS and published and shared through ArcGIS Online or an enterprise portal that uh, organizations have access to. <coughs> Esri is also performing some research and encourage you to scan the link on screen here. Um, otherwise, we'll get you the report link in due course. Some really interesting findings. It was a collaboration between ourselves and our global alliance partner, Autodesk, mainly focused around AECs in the sustainable, sustainability or ESG um, area. But you can see here kind of the why. And the reason why I'm sharing this is interchangeably, the discussion or topic around digital twins that are spatially enabled um, invokes kind of uh, conversations around patterns of integrating between GIS and BIM namely. And here in this report, it found against a, a multitude of projects, um, some pretty interesting findings. And so this is really to assist yourselves in the value proposition if you're receiving blockers internally around, no, we'll just do BAU because the way we've already done it um, and it's part of our fabric or muscle memory 
hopefully some of these will highlight the benefit gains uh, by pivoting to more modern uh, integration practices or approaches. So if we roll back to kind of the value pr proposition and why a spatially enabled digital twin is better than just a digital twin in situ, it's really the ability to offer that level of detail available at scale. So we realize that many of you on the call have a multitude of assets in a specific locality or an entire state or arguably some of you globally, and you want to have the world at your fingertips to be able to go anywhere and see inside of the common canvas that is geography, um, the content, be it CAD or BIM depicted on the right, plus all the other information could be relating to work orders and so forth. So really a spatially enabled digital twin is the, the only path forward that we see uh, to, to assist you in this kind of endeavor. So I often get asked, well, that sounds great, Seth, but show me, um, prove it to me. Um, what you're seeing on screen here is quite an interesting, albeit kind of a city information model. It's particularly for a, a campus. This is uh, Ohio State University. But it's really interesting because in this, we have 80 different uh, BIM models or what some people describe as digital twins natively themselves ingested through ArcGIS Pro, published as a web scene, and this is now usable for a whole multitude of use cases. Um, you can imagine using this uh, on my phone uh, or even ahead of time to assist with um, asset management, uh, even safety. So being able to do uh, proactive planning around a simulated evacuation, inherently having this digital twin um, can be a, a really useful tool for the HR teams and safety teams um, uh, uh, starting to plan that ev um, simulated event. So hopefully um, you can see that by leveraging this geography as a commonality, enables us to attend to um, not just one project, but your entire portfolio of assets and projects, no matter what stage or level of detail are available. And at each of those phases or stages, rest assured there are many capabilities built into ArcGIS and our partner solutions um, that can enable you to kind of reuse that content um, for say facility management, for operational insights and analytics, uh, for contractor uh, management. So here, being able to fuse your spatial enabled um, architectural models with say geotech photos as um, evidence for your finance team around work package completion. These are some quite unique and new use cases we're seeing around the grounds um, in, in Australia and beyond. So if we come back to um, the core ingredients, and we saw this briefly back on um, that scale slide. So what GIS does not do, nor uh, will it ever have aspirations to attend to, is to replace the important design world. Um, this is the likes of uh, Autodesk and the ability to uh, create um, and draft traditional CAD or civil drawings, um, but equally uh, BIM models um, and the likes. So rather than kind of step on that domain and those personas and those resources and specialists, uh, the mantra is very much to reuse that content inside of GIS and GIS is that harmonizing glue through geography that also enables us to enrich that experience for your users with other information, be it uh, related to say the, the landscaping depicted on screen there or other information around property boundaries and, and core foundational geospatial data back to Anslick's principles at the start. So yeah, we're not looking to replace um, and create BIM models, um, but rather reuse, and hopefully that's kind of um, clear. 
but as you can appreciate, it's very much um, an iterative cycle, often a spin cycle, um, um, depending on the velocity of and frequency frequency of updates and workflows. Um, but it's definitely um, a harmonized experience between um, uh, kind of the BIM content and CAD content and your GIS information. And it's a very cyclic manner. Um, and hopefully throughout time, that level of detail and level of information will be enriched so that the users have an increased experience from uh, the valuable insights and knowledge uh, accessible through a spatially enabled digital twin. And so what you see on screen here is just a, a fusion of um, an Esri and Autodesk centric world. But we realize there are kind of many other vendors, including some homegrown heroes in um, you know, 12D, uh, Bentley, and increasingly um, open standards led through Building Smart um, with IFC file formats and, and so forth. So this slide is hopefully important and useful to some of you, uh, hopefully most of you on the call. Many of you, um, Trevor and Jason, have informed me um, uh, obviously use ArcGIS, but also use um, Autodesk as part of your CAD and BIM um, uh, world. Um, so this is just a quick snapshot of the latest and greatest state of integrations between Esri and Autodesk. Um, and looking back um, five years ago or more, um, it was a very different pattern. And what you can see down the bottom here, um, is some new patterns. So the patterns back in 20, uh, 2007 uh, between AutoCAD and ArcGIS for AutoCAD were really, uh, I would describe them as desktop to desktop, reliant on a CAD specialist driving a desktop application and a GI specialist um, driving uh, ArcMap at the time. And then we have started to mature um, that connectivity to patterns of cloud to desktop, whereby ArcGIS Pro now can directly connect to Autodesk Construction Cloud as the master curator of um, BIM and CAD and other file format uh, version management as a traditional DMS, a drawing or document management system, which Esri is not. <coughs> and what's really exciting now is we have a new pattern, which is cloud to cloud which enables us to offer up access to sonars that are non-specialists, so project directors, senior management. And here we get that immediate kind of return on investment. They start to um, interact and uh, want more insights around the content, want to integrate with other systems like SCADA and IT, which is, um, you know, hopefully uh, useful to yourselves and, and kind of, um, uh, the valuable work you're doing in your organizations. So ArcGIS GeoBIM is this new cloud to cloud pattern um, between a BIM CAD repository um, right now, just Autodesk, um, and to 2D or 3D maps or web scenes that you've configured with published content from Pro, um, such as 2D uh, drawings and 3D uh, BIM models uh, to again expedite people being able to click on that geographic context and check the latest version in held in Autodesk and so forth and offer me that side by side view, which would otherwise be that kind of two screen dilemma or swivel chair approach. So here we can see on the left that um, web scene. Uh, pre-configured and published and curated with content in ArcGIS, in this case ArcGIS Online, but rest assured um, support for ArcGIS Enterprise with GeoBIM is, is firmly in the roadmap, um, hopefully this year at some point. And so this enables us to kind of click on the features and show linked uh, documents or elements um, in Autodesk held in the right, um, which would otherwise, you know, take, um, a facility manager or asset manager or project um, uh, controller kind of a lot of time to dive in without that aid of a visualization that speaks back to uh, geography. 
arguably you could just use Autodesk Construction Cloud, but as you can see, it's a fishbowl approach and doesn't enable you to have this cumulative view of your entire portfolio of assets or projects, which ArcGIS can do using that common canvas of geography. But outside of GeoBIM, um, which is actually built on an ArcGIS Experience Builder Developer Edition under the hood, um, you can still um, use and reuse the content you have available um, outside of GeoBIM, especially if you don't have Autodesk or Autodesk Construction Cloud, which is a key requirement for GeoBIM adoption right now. So here in this pattern, we've got a couple of depictions here, a, a simple 2D um, activity tracking experience builder app for a council on the south coast of New South Wales. <clears throat> and then on the bottom there, we've got the uh, Snowy Hydro or Snowy 2 virtual tour built on experience builder. And here we're reusing content captured via site scan through the surveillance officers uh, 360s of progress at key uh, place points across the project site, but equally um, cinematic kind of um, uh, drone footage that's been captured on pinch points like the whole roads in and out of um, the Snowy 2 uh, uh, area, uh, which is that whole road example that um, uh, Jason mentioned at the outset of today's session. So we'll jump over now to some uh, regional, national, and kind of global examples. But yeah, I just want to open up now. If um, anyone had any questions, please please feel free to uh, use the chat. Um, otherwise, were there any questions from yourself, Trev, or or Jason? Uh, no, I was actually just going to ask about yeah, if if they're not using you know Autodesk, what's the process look like? And you sort of touched on that, but um, obviously within um, within the resources sector, we we tend to have a greater blend of of technologies than what we might see with our colleagues working in local government AEC. And so yeah. often there is that, um, I guess, a bit of hard work around the data manipulation and bringing things together. Um, so have you got any thoughts on, on how that process might look like? Yeah, re really good point. I'll just um, jump to... Um, yeah, so yeah, just... Kind of a, a quick summary slide of you know some of the non autodesk content so um ifc is an open standard now for bim um but equally there's many others like solidworks and um, other um, vendors um, 3d models um, i'll describe say solidworks as one example if you have plant available in that format um, that would be a, a an fme kind of ETL process to transform that into something readable by ArcGIS. Um, IFC, the good news is Esri is actually um, subscribed to the Building Smart, so there's the global standard body. Um, so we're on that board now, and that has meant that um, in Pro um, 3.0 or later, so the latest version 3.1, you can actually um, read in IFC models um, in the 2X uh, and, and 4X variants. So um, we're updating the documentation because it's not um, that clear um, on our help documentation page ab about that support. So um, yeah, just to kind of depict a bit of a pattern um, uh, that might be useful for for, for yourselves. Yeah. Thanks, Drew. Thanks, Seth. And it was just, I guess, just touching on one of the comments you made around reuse. I mean, that's something typically um, we do talk about a lot in the resources sector, whereas the, the GIS is, is not there to replace something. It is maybe to reuse concept, make it uh, con um, content, I should say, make it more accessible to others. And I think that's a real key factor. And I think if we double down on that in resources, I mean, I'm, I'm here in, in Perth, Seth, and when I look up, I can see um, what our town's built on uh, and where all the people are working and yet operations are thousands of kilometres away. So that digital twin, we're actually seeing things in real time and you talked about time enabled, um, very asset intensive industries, right? And mm. we want to look at our maintenance schedules. Um, we maybe want to overlay that with impacts from dust or, or weather events that come in. And that's where I think there's, there's huge value in this. Um, what I do see is that lack of geography that you've talked about. So that's, I, I think that's a really important factor there. Um, yeah, thanks. 
Great, thanks, we've got Jim. A, yeah, I think we've got a question here as well, um, Jason, in the chat. I was hoping you were going to take that one, Trev, but yeah, no, no problem at all. Thanks, Peter, for um, providing the question. Um, so, yeah, Seth, at a high level, what would be the approach in dealing with brownfield assets where the level of a clean digital is not common? What resources are required to develop and then maintain? Thank you. Can you hear yeah. your thoughts on that, mate? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Trevor. Um, it's actually a really good question, Peter, and yeah, thanks for asking that. It, it reminds me of um, a particular brownfield project, uh, which is a, a case study here, um, the Secular Key Renewal Project, um, where we had a remit. We were supporting um, a, a few firms at the time, but as you can appreciate, um, it's truly a brownfield site um, with quite complex um, uh, infrastructure, both above um, at ground and, and below ground or um, uh, below water, so to speak. And part of the kind of approach is um, you could just survey and scan. Um, so that's actually what happened on uh, this project where there was a, a bunch of uh, 3D point cloud scans. And sometimes being able to load that into your ArcGIS as a visualization, if it's you know attributed with um, RGB uh, colorized. Uh, returns, then sometimes that can suffice. And we have seen use cases in organizations where they don't go to the next degree of taking a scan to turn it into a, a BIM model, uh, which is you know a process that, say, Autodesk have through recap, um, which is what was used on this particular project. So sometimes you know, can reuse the scan as a representation of, of the level, level of detail available. And obviously, ArcGIS is well versed to uh, in pro import and publish that and and experience that in immersive web scenes as, as an example um, but yeah you it's, it's a hard task you're never going to end up with um, clean data and um, a really kind of transparent existing use cases snowy hydro is you know got um, all these new architectural models on snowy too but they've obviously got le legacy infrastructure from the the original scheme 75 years ago so in the process of back capturing and scanning that as a representation, but again, as reality capture, so they can kind of use it to do uh, confined space planning rather than, you know, spending time on site in those confined environs. Um, so yeah, a multitude of interesting use cases. Uh, rest assured, you don't need to get your data per perfect. And what we're finding is by exposing that data, imperfect data, it invokes a lot of more questions and uh, often uh, it will just suffice that so people don't need to go to that next degree of of turning it into a, a BIM model, um, which was uh, what we did here. So on Circular Key, the scan to BIM process, this is inside of Revit here, uh, took all of those um, returns, turned it into a colorized um, set of um, Revit models in this case. And we were then able to ingest that along with um, the raw point clouds um, into this kind of connected uh, data environment. Um, and that resulted in this asset information model, um, which looked kind of more realistic in ArcGIS, uh, just through a, a scene viewer, a 3D scene viewer. But obviously some of the value add was the logic to link uh, similar to what's built into the fabric of GeoBIM to say the repository, in this case it was innate, um, uh, formerly team binder, but equally that could be as simple as SharePoint or, or as advanced as uh, some of the more advanced kind of um, document management systems. Um, so this enables people to click on the defect, get the report from the GIS as the glue, rather than need, needing to wade through folder structures in innate or SharePoint um, without any visualization aid. So it saves them a whole bunch of time, effort, um, and obviously uh, uh, money down the track. Uh, by adopting this approach. Um, okay, so just um, just while you bring up the next thing to add to that, um, Peter, we did a uh, it's a little while ago now, but a POC with one of our customers looking at a fairly intensive uh, facility, and there was an option we could just do some sort of scan. And we'll have a three D representation, um, but it got down to what's the purpose? What do, what do we want to get out of the digital twin? And so, whilst the the three D scan um, at that point in time, 
had a nice representation and you could do measurements and things like that. They wanted to do a little bit more, so the choice was made to, to get the 2D data, which they had, and extrude that into the 3D model. So they knew the size of the pipes, they knew how high off they were off the ground, so that actually built then the 3D model from the ground up. But building it that way enabled them to integrate um, with things like asset management so they could look at scheduling uh, for asset maintenance and things. So probably the first thing to consider is what do you want? What's the purpose of it? And, and that will help dictate the path you take. Yeah, thanks Trevor. That's yeah, really interesting insights. And um, just while we're on the topic of kind of uh, national or local Australian case studies, I was sharing some of the global research from Atkins and Esri ourselves. Um, but this one's quite pertinent. Um, just um, a reflection between two similar size uh, road projects, albeit um, in New South Wales. Uh, this has come from Transport for New South Wales, who are mandating this digital engineering framework for all procurement of projects going forward. And so this is a really good benchmark to actually prove the value of, of adopting spatially enabled digital twin. Um, and that included, um, whilst not mentioned here, uh, you know, a GIS um, similar to actually the Circular Key project was one of the uh, other pilot projects for this. Uh, so add uh, 3D BIM and GIS into the mix here. We can see some of the, you know, the RFI reductions during the kind of tender phase, um, the variations and uh, uh, reduction in um, overall uh, project duration and, and variations. Um, huge kind of um, uh, wins for, you know, the why, uh, which may help yourselves and your organisations uh, to, to justify, say, uh, any internal changes. <clears throat> okay, so we'll just walk through a couple examples now. And as I mentioned um, at the outset, we'll get you these links um, so you can have a play around for yourselves. This is that um, kind of core uh, site that um, I mentioned or referred to before, where you access that uh, ANSLIC uh, principles. And what's really interesting, and in, in this is um, the kind of level of maturity diagram, and also that notion of the the ten kind of foundational geospatial themes, um, which um, many state governments have adopted. Most notably, um, the New South Wales government. So that's that diagram before. And here you'll see the 10 core themes. Um, and then down here on uh, this page, you'll see that uh, digital twin maturity model. So just to kind of loop back to some of the perhaps strange language I was using at this front end around level of detail, level of information and, and level of maturity. Uh, this can be your guiding light as far as that. The green you've probably got, it's your bread and butter. Uh, as we start to mature, then we start to be able to actuate, energize and automate or simulate using a spatially enabled digital twin as the vision. And yeah, you can see that now in the New South Wales government there, 10 themes, um, which is their foundational spatial data infrastructure. <clears throat> okay, so I mentioned Snowy 2 and the virtual tour. Um, I think this is an interesting one. Um, there's an internal version uh, with simplified geometry, um, like 3D tunnel strings and so forth. So even if you have a federated BIM model or digital twin available, it doesn't mean you need to always use it. Sometimes a redacted or simplified version of design information can suffice. But what I like about this one is the ability to, and this is uh, publicly available, uh, link in 360s that the surveillance officers have captured. And this is inherently useful for their uh, safety teams um, and their communications teams, uh, and they're using this um, to assist with uh, planning before people are doing their 10 day on shifts uh, because the site is very remote and uh, in light of COVID, there was restrictions on accessing the site. So the more they could do to familiarize yourself around changes of site, um, the better they, they would be. Um, as far as efficiency once they were on site. <clears throat> and here, this is just a, a look at some of that reusable additional content like, um, you know, surveillance flights from uh, drone imagery is just one of the many examples. 
that particular solution uh, originally stemmed from a project over in Switzerland, um, and I'll show you a couple of Swiss examples, um, namely because they pertain to subsurface, and um, the second one will uh, be relevant to anyone doing excavation. In this particular one um, in Switzerland, they've <coughs> integrated a, just a simplified version of their design, so you're not seeing the BIM model here, but um, the reason why this is uh, quite useful is being able to then use some of our built-in tools nowadays. So uh, this kind of interactive profile, reading out the existing ground level RL off the orange to the tunnel race here, there would otherwise be um, a long section or cross section CAD output um, typically is, is how we see that. But now we can reuse some of that simplified 3D control strings inside a GIS, and then this becomes a self-service capability in things like web scenes and, and experience builder as, as just examples. This next one is again in Switzerland, but starting to integrate other subsurface information, including geology, uh, which will be relevant to many of you. And as you can see here, we're starting to integrate um, a tunnel infrastructure that's available. Um, but interestingly, back to the point that um, uh, Trev uh, uh, fed back before, as well as uh, your kind of question, Peter, um, they've also integrated some scans. Um, so these are uh, from a surveyor, they've scanned uh, the subsurface um, uh, uh, tunnel um, and uh, the excavated portions, but then they've gone to that process I described we did for circular key of scan to BIM. And so this means that we've got now a BIM model and I can start to do proactive planning, say on this face, and use all the tools we saw before, including profile or even just simple uh, me uh, measurements, including that snapping logic, which is uh, nice to have. Why is this important? That use and reuse of content that would otherwise reside in a specialist tool, be it CAD or BIM software. Now we can expose that to others to reuse and most importantly, uh, not disrupt the higher value outcomes that your GIS team is striving towards. So, you know, rather than having, you know, physical or virtual shoulder taps to say, hey, can you tell me what the length of this is? Actually enabling the masses to do that themselves in your GIS or online organization or enterprise portal. If we roll from kind of subsurface now to surface, we can start to actually integrate a plant. So you most probably have plant infrastructure. If I just roll back there to get a bit of a perspective. So whilst this is a water treatment plant, could be a substation or other type facility you have at surface or even subsurface. And one of the great benefits of this is being able to fuse together um, system or asset information. Um, so you can see here this particular valve, it has a simplified um, schema. Um, if that was, if we wanted to just expose the original schema from the BIM model, it clearly we can do that. But the advantage of a spatially enabled digital twin is ArcGIS offers flexibility to offer up the schema to the users that you might so choose. And can see here there's a field called web link. When I click on that, that's going to do the pattern I described from circular key of bringing up that manufacturer spec, which would otherwise be someone with a physical manual or slaving away trying to find, you know, how to replace or re replenish this part and whether the um, original manufacturer is still uh, available and so forth. So yeah, the GIS is then becoming that stickiness and glue to harmonize together. Um, um, a multitude of information, including like reports, as we just saw. The last two examples um, are looking at kind of other uh, resource sessions you've had centered around kind of reality capture and uh, drone capabilities. This one is uh, for a development here, um, uh, actually on the Esri Redlands campus. And um, when I roll back to time and pivot to uh, 2D, you can see this ortho mosaic of what the site looked like formerly. Um, but I can roll forward to the most recent um, uh, imagery captured in ortho mosaic or pivot to 3D and start to see that 
uh, photo mesh. I can then toggle in the kind of building information model. And this is really interesting now. I can start to drop out that photorealistic mesh for the BIM model. And now I've got an as built or issue for construction uh, BIM model. And I can compare and contrast that against um, what was actually built, as well as roll back in time to say earlier epochs where maybe that conceptual model looks slightly different, but also explore through the building uh, to all of its uh, parts as we saw back in the slides earlier. And lastly, the last one to, um, uh, to, to look at is more centered around resources. And this is an oil, oil and gas example. We've got our uh, model content, but now we're kind of rolling back to an entire portfolio of assets that are available. And I can get some real time alerts and start to integrate that from, say, SCADA. <coughs> Excuse me. And start to integrate this into our spatially enabled digital twin. Equally, we can start to look at the analysis or uh, simulation. So, if you recall, that was a use case to be able to uh, analyze data um, in our spatially enabled digital twin. And lastly, the ability to uh, look for uh, other assets, including uh, your important employees or contractors, and check on them and monitor their progress, um, especially if they're working. Um, in remote areas um, um, uh, just by themselves is one of the kind of uh, examples. And lastly, um, <clears throat> outside of outside of um, this entire portfolio perspective depicted here um, in our 3D uh, web scene, being also able to look at this in a, a unique alternate way, which is this notion of, you know, um, uh, knowledge graphs or uh, connected digital twins. And the reason why this is really important is um, some of the work that's coming out of the digital twin hub in um, the UK, and they've developed a uh, visualization tool called the uh, Climate Resilience Demonstrator. And that, um, similar to this example from New Zealand, enables us to fuse together um, modeled information that's available, such as uh, just, you know, one in 100 year flood back to the point that Jason raised at the start of today's session and be able to analyze and visualize the analysis output and a, um, a web-based experience. So, thank you. Thanks, um, Seth. I'm just going to quickly yeah, flag, sure. we are at 12 noon uh, perf time. Um, we're getting a lot of questions here and I can see you've got a little bit more you want to show. So uh, happy to continue um, for everybody who can stay on the call a little bit longer. We are recording. We are going to share it um, after this, but there's some really interesting questions I would love to touch on at the end. So um, yeah, sure, no worries. charge uh, that, on, mate. Thank you. Yeah, that's all I had to um, to wrap up on. So there were the, the, the key demos. Um, but yeah, if you can help me out with just the, the questions in the chat for me, uh, and I can tend to those now, and for those that can stay on, um, by all means, you're welcome to. Otherwise, we'll get you that recording, as Jason's mentioned. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Um, well, I'll start off, um, Peter Roussos just made a comment. Um, the link to the manufacturer specs are great from a safety view um, mm -hmm. and maintenance view. Absolutely, that, that thing excited me when I was seeing that. That's really cool. I've Before I got into GIS, I, I came from SolidWorks, so I, I understand, you know, um, that side of things. Um, yeah. Hamish McDougall asked a question. Is that hard to maintain though? So that's a, I think that's a really interesting question. You know, the links between you know, the manufacturer drawings and specifications and all the parts for an asset that you're main, like, you know, that you're managing right now. How, you know, just interest, interested to hear your feedback on that one. Yeah, so in this particular example, um, obviously that web link, I think this is what you're referring to here, that's that's hard coded in the, the database, the schema in the yeah. bottom left there. Um, if you squint your eyes, you can see that um, URL parameter link. So if the website updates or the domain changes, then this link is severed and you're in a pickle or problem, which I think is Hamish's point. Um, the pattern that's built into, say, ArcGIS GeoBoom, which is instead of hard coding this, just linking from model elements to 
it, it, its master version um, in a drawing or document management system. In this case, it's Autodesk Construction Cloud through Autodesk Docs. That's a you know a fused or or future proof kind of uh, uh, link to document pattern. Um, but yeah, by all means, um, uh, there's numerous ways you can approach this, um, and um, yeah, I, I haven't seen uh, something uh, that really solves everything. And I think one of the most interesting uh, issues we had, say, on the Secular Key project, was we were assisting in the um, the planning stage. So we were assisting an AEC firm to do the capture for Circular Key. And obviously they didn't have access to the owner operator Transport for New South Wales uh, DMS uh, being an eight. So the links kind of had to be a temporary fix to enable them to visualize and demonstrate in the plan phase. But as they handed over this federated model, the asset information model, um, those links were broken um, because they needed to speak to rather than SharePoint used by in the planning stage needed to speak to the the master document management system being innate uh, which the the owner operator transport had to uh, bulk do you can use some logic as far as the root level concatenation and kind of bulk find and replacing but um, yeah and excitingly we are working on a, a solution at, at the moment um, uh, called geovonic connect which is uh, aimed at um, assisting organizations and and connecting in a services oriented architecture based on APIs to fetch and receive uh, and ensure that it's the latest information linked from uh, 2D or 3D objects in ArcGIS. Um, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. I see there's another question from Ben also. So, um, what ArcGIS service types are used to host the imagery and photo mesh models over the over time? In the previous example, um, is it image service with the mosaic data set? I'm not sure which example Ben was referring to. It, yeah, I think the, the um, let me just get that for you, Ben. Um, sorry, I closed the link. I think it's this one. Um, yeah, cool. Thanks, Ben, for confirming. Um, yeah, so this is obviously a, a JavaScript sample from Esri. You're welcome to use this. We have many firms using this already, but for their own kind of projects. All of the epochs here represent uh, separate um, uh, endpoints. Um, so I3S um, scene services that have been published in this case to ArcGIS Online. Uh, the smarts and the logic is really in the UI, which is you know based on our JavaScript uh, uh, ArcGIS Maps SDK for JavaScript, as it's now known. Um, yeah, so hopefully that answers your question. It's not leveraging image server uh, at all in this example. Um, some organizations like Snowy do use image server um, for uh, their timely updates from a multitude of sources like surveillance offices and area metrics and other vendors that are fly in and out of the scheme area and so forth. But um, yeah, so hopefully that answered that question. Um, so yeah, it's a scene service type I3S endpoint uh, for all of these. Yeah. No worries. Thanks, Ben. Is there any others I missed, Jason? Or? No, I think that's it, unless, um, oh, Peter's jumped in. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> can digital, <laughs> can oh, digital cool. twins be used for safety scenarios in a plant? Um, i.e. before doing shutdowns uh, to be able to highlight hazards and audit the actual process to ID in any flaw falls in process. Great question. Um, Possibly stumped Seth by the sounds no, of it. No, 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 not stumped, <laughs> just, just hustling together some, um, uh, some, some, uh, some useful kind of balls pictures. Coming. Yeah. Yeah, keep the so, balls um, coming, guys. <laughs> yeah, it's a really interesting one. I, I mentioned briefly a use case uh, or value proposition from HR, which is strange around kind of using digital spatially enabled digital twins in ArcGIS for evacuation planning. 
Uh, this is a model from my hometown. If you picked up my accent on Kiwi, yes, from Christchurch. This is the new library in Christchurch, New Zealand. And it's, um, you know, a, a Revit model, BIM model, and I can see the schema that's all well and good. But actually what they've done is uh, reuse this content for uh, about half a dozen use cases. This one's designed for uh, asset management. So as I toggle on the um, Christchurch City Council Three Waters utility infrastructure will display. Uh, takes a little while because it's coming from the enterprise. Um, but one of the other use cases is for um, kind of safety scenarios, right? And that is often, uh, you know, a lot of these facilities are confined spaces or, you know, risky or there's perils that could potentially be exposed. So you want to limit the amount of time you spend there. The other side is uh, to take what would otherwise be a 2D um, A3 poster of your evacuation plan and instead fuse that with your uh, BIM model. And in this case, now, um, if I click properly, um, there we go. In this case, now I've got a planned or proposed evacuation route to a safe zone, uh, but reusing the same model we saw back here in the, there we go, yes, utilities are slowly joining, reusing the um, uh, same model I published originally. So it's that use and reuse of the content originally from CAD and BIM world, but also equally the use and reuse within um, uh, GIS and ArcGIS itself. Um, and the last use case, um, uh, building, um, is for kind of communications and, and, and marketing, uh, almost akin to like that Snowy 2 virtual tour. And this is just another sample, like the, the sample I showed before that uh, in relation to Ben's question, whereby they've used and reused this in their GIS, but now instead it's for a, a slicker, arguably, um, uh, solution that's suitable to go in the public domain now. But again, it's just using and reusing the same content that we saw before uh, back in the previous uh, web scenes um, as examples. So hopefully that, that helps a little bit, Peter. A couple of um, examples I've had discussions with Seth is one around a refinery, which is obviously a really um, high risk, dangerous environment. And before shutdowns, just using a digital temple, simple things like uh, access you mentioned at confined space, um, but also measuring items in the plant and equipment so they can do some of that uh, engineering before being on site, so they're limiting the, the time on site. The other one that I've had discussions around is with the scheduling of maintenance and um, maintenance at height. So you, you, you want to make sure that your maintenance schedule allows for if something's happening above, that there's nothing scheduled for below. So some really simple um, scenarios on, on, on that respect. Yeah, and it's probably, um... I did mention it briefly uh, earlier, but um, it would be remiss of me not to mention it now um, based on um, Peter's great um, feedback just, just here. Uh, let me just bring it up. But let's just say that the three-dimensional perspective is not advantageous to kind of doing auditing and, and maybe that facility is uh, multi-level or both above or below ground. Um, uh, you know, which many of them are. So we can actually kind of, similar to how we redacted or simplified the geometry available in the design content, uh, we can actually also simplify it um, to instead be uh, the the flaws. Um, so what I mean by that is um, we now have the ability to publish, you know, 2.5D floor aware maps. So that means that um, this is that same uh, library in New Zealand. And now I have the ability to toggle between the floors and my audit on level four using, say, um, one of our mobile tools like Field Maps, uh, which I'll just bring up here. Oh, not that one. So this is uh, the same uh, web map now in ArcGIS Field Maps, and this enables me to access uh, all the floor levels and collect information uh, that relates to that specific floor. Obviously, once I've captured that, that would be available here, would have that same floor aware nature so that um, 
as people were kind of uh, cross -check checking whether it's a geotag photo and you're leveraging orientated imagery. Um, this could be the, you know, the the auditing uh, spatially enabled digital twin level of detail that they require for that mode. Um, uh, but maybe for other modes or use cases, uh, maybe this or or this perspective or even this asset management perspective um, is is the best um, uh, for that particular use case. Um, yeah, hopefully that helps, Peter. Um, but yeah, really interested in that. So maybe we can pick that up uh, outside of today's session. Thank you. Cool. Hey, thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, it's worth noting. Um, um, so Flora, we're uh, maps are a capability of um, ArcGIS indoors, but um, only you only need the ArcGIS indoors extension for ArcGIS Pro to create what you see on screen here. And then for those that are familiar with ArcGIS Experience Builder, you've probably seen a floor level widget. Um, I'm just leveraging that in this particular example. Uh, this one's also publicly available, so I'll make sure all the links from today will, will get to you to, to peruse and explore. Um, but I feel like that support for FloraWare maps in ArcGIS field maps is hugely beneficial for condition assessments, uh, that auditing you mentioned before, Peter, and um, sounds like you've probably got a use case there as well, Steve, so yeah, thank you. Now, Seth, I know we've gone over time, um, but I have a, a question for you. Sure. Um, which is a discussion I've had with a with a couple of different clients, and that's the integration of this with virtual reality, um, like uh, wearables glasses, for instance. So, a scenario might be your uh, you've got some maintenance work to do. Um, let's just say you're working on a on a, a vehicle. Uh, you've got your v VR glasses on. You can explode a uh, say a broken part out and then order the bits you need by clicking on that bit and it will um, go and make sure that that's the part ordered rather than someone flicking through a catalog to get the right product code number so mm -hmm. not not necessarily have you seen that whole example in in um, end to end process but the integration of this with those some of those VR um, wearable type stuff do you see it on that path or if you've heard of it uh, someone doing that yeah, in fact, I had a session just last week with, um, albeit from the commercial property sector, and um, this is where we look to lean on our partners. Um, and probably the the one I'd recommend the most is uh, VGIS. Um, what VGIS enables you to do is really twofold. It enables you to take your and connect your ArcGIS um, web services into their um, uh, AR or augmented reality or mixed reality uh, capability and they have got native um, mobile uh, apps to support that pattern but also um, you know if you're looking to leverage um, uh, lens from uh, Microsoft or other kind of wearables um, they have a lot of that built and importantly um, support some of the accuracy requirements um, both in the resource sector and, and beyond including utilities it's you know having centimetre level accuracy is important uh, for existing subsurface utilities. But as you can see in that um, quick snapshot, the ability to visualise and augment reality uh, proposed future building. So that's a facility that this um, person's kind of visually, uh, sorry, virtually interacting with in his um, uh, lens experience. So yeah, if you're interested in that, um, by all means we can um, take that offline. Uh, that one's really great reality capture so being able to you know if you've got a trench uh, you see it once before it's infield infield uh, use vgis to do that reality capture for the trench and then reuse that in vgis or beyond in artgis um, so we see that a lot for test pores itps itrs where you only get one shot to kind of take a view of that and that's inherently re reusable for uh, future plan work so where um, services or other uh, assets are buried, as an example. Yep. I think I'd end Thanks. up falling in some of those holes or tripping over something wearing one of those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it can, can be a lonely experience at times uh, with the goggles, but um, we're seeing that most people, including users, are comfortable with um, 
uh, with you know iPads, which you know VGIs and there's other vendors like Trimble with, with, with their site vision platform. Um, but yeah, um, sounds like a topic for a future rug uh, there, uh, Trevor and, <laughs> and Jason. That sounds Happy to you. excellent. I really appreciated today, Seth. Uh, your presentation has been great, and thank you. Um, for everyone who's asked questions, you know, it makes it more valuable to us and hopefully valuable to you. So, yeah, I would like to yeah, thank you for your attention. Um, I hope it, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you today about Digital Twins, and we hope that you found this presentation informative and thought provoking. Uh, we have recorded today. Uh, we will we'll be sharing that recording in the coming weeks. And of course, we are happy to assist you with your conversations with your teams, whether it be digital transformation teams or anyone else that just wants to understand the value of GIS and where it can play in your you know, everyday activities. Um, I do want to point you towards some links on the screen. Um, so I've put a link to Ezra Australia's digital twin link, obviously our website um, and some other useful links. We've got, um, you know, so Directions Live and our LinkedIn page as well. So if you please join our groups, it'd be fantastic. Um, we'd also love, love to hear your recommendations or what themes you want to hear for future sessions. So this chat stays open, just like all Teams chats. Please feel free to drop something in there if you think of an idea later on or send us an email or contact, contact us directly. But before we do close up, absolutely want to thank Seth Gorey again for his support. Loved the presentation. Um, really, really great, mate. Really appreciate it. It seemed like it resonated with a lot of people. Um, and last but not least, I want to thank everyone for your time again. We hope you enjoyed the session. Uh, we wish you um, a safe and enjoyable long week ahead. i am um, got lots of plans myself. I'm looking forward to it. So thank you very much. Good day to everybody um, and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Speak Thanks, soon. everyone.